In this episode, can we talk about your WordPress projects? We're going to talk about the number one problem everyone tells me they're struggling with. You might remember if you've signed up for pretty much any of my freebies or the WP Project Managers Academy, you know I ask that question a lot. What are you struggling with most? And far and away, it is getting content from the client. So today, I'm going to show you a practical approach for getting that done. If any of you attended the webinar I did on iThemes training, was it last week or the week before? Time is going by so fast. Then this might be a little bit of a repeat for you, but you can't hear this stuff enough. The um, key to online learning, or the key to any learning is repetition. That's how you remember things and they become a part of what you do every day. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen. If you're watching the replay later, if you type replay, that lets me know other people got to see this too. If you're watching now, it would be really helpful if you just shoot me a little comment in the comments so I know you're there. And I can see if you have any questions as we go along as well. I also do not look so beautiful today because I've had some issues I had to straighten out with member press in the academy. And so... I quit. Well, you know, the guys don't worry about that. They come in in the t-shirt and they look the same and they might not be shaven, but I always want to go get all dolled up before I do these lives, but yeah, not today. Okay. So I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully I'll get the right one. Let's share. And we're going to share this one. And okay. Let me stop this for one second. And now I can see the chat and my speaker notes at the same time. Excellent. I won't have to refer to them a lot. I just like to look at them to make sure that I told you everything. We're not going to talk just about how to control the content part. We're going to talk about content first design and content first development. They're not the same thing. I remember hearing a, a, a talk by Jennifer Bourne a long time ago, <clears throat> a long time ago, it was last year, I believe. She was talking about how content first design was never meant to be about getting all the content up front and how that doesn't work and blah, blah. And I was like, no, it does work. So rather than call it content first design, it's content first development. I know I follow this procedure. Nathan Ingram follows this procedure. I'm pretty sure Melanie Adcock follows this procedure. It's the only way to make sure your clients adhere to the schedule. Now I know it seems like if it were my business, and I was building a website, I would be focused on that. I would do everything I could to meet the dates. But you have to understand that that's not the only project that your client has going on. They've got a business to run. Things come up and they're probably homeschooling their children <laughs> and all of that stuff that's going on right now. So it's not going to be top of mind unless you make it top of mind. It's not going to be a priority unless you make it a priority from the get-go of the project. It's too late to do when you're in the throes of, did you send the content? This isn't the right format. That's not what I asked for. All of that stuff. And when you're in the throes of that, it's too late. You have to do this at the very beginning of the project. Actually, a part of this needs to be covered when you're in your whole pre-proposal phase. You need to let them know what their responsibilities are in this project. So many clients, and again, not their fault. I get so frustrated with WordPress people who talk about their clients like they're stupid. They're not stupid. We could use the word ignorant, but that has a bad connotation. What ignorant really means is you've never been told that, so you don't really know. They have all this TV ads and all that stuff they're, they're watching all the time, that building a website's not that hard, and they think they can just pass it off to you, go off, do their stuff, come back, and they've got a website. They don't realize that they need to be involved. They don't realize what is involved with them. So I'm going to show you some techniques to take care of that. In the chat right now, those of you who are watching, and even if you're watching the replay, go ahead and type this. How long would it actually take you to build a website if everything was defined and everything was waiting for you? You're just pulling it off the shelf. Let's say it's a five page brochure website. There's no huge functionality, contact us, all of that. How long would it actually take you to build that website? A five page brochure website, if all the content was ready, everything was ready to go, how long? Okay, there's a delay, so I have to wait for y'all to answer. <laughs> so while you're answering that question, I'll go on to the next slide. 
All right, so this is the basic problem. This is the way we always used to do this work, which really never has made sense to me that we wait till the very end to get paid. You do work, but you're not getting paid for it until later. That just doesn't make sense to me. But anyway, this is the way it was always before. You get a 50% deposit up front. Then you would start developing the website. It'd be time for the content to be brought in by whoever's bringing it in. Yeah, so Todd's saying about a week. Todd is saying no distractions, a few days. I could build a five-page brochure website in a few hours, y'all, if I had everything there with me and I already had the design laid out and all that stuff. I was hoping somebody would come back and say in, in less than a week, a couple of days if everything is in. Exactly. So it's not going to take very long. What takes long is gathering and pulling teeth and all that stuff. But what tends to happen is you get to this content part and the client doesn't deliver. So what do you say? You say, well, I'll just go ahead and finish out the website. Then when they get the content, I'll just plop it in. And then it comes time and they just never give you the content or it just takes months and months and months. I've heard people go in two and three years waiting on content. Pardon me one moment. <clears throat> That's never happened to me. But it could, if you have your payment structure set up this way. The other thing that's wrong with this graphic is that the stages of a web development project are not even this way. There's typically, in, in our methodology, and I teach students in the academy, is that the biggest part is in planning, and then the development doesn't take very long at all, if you plan it out the right way. And Melanie's saying just a few days if she already has the design. Yeah, I was saying you have the design laid out, you have the content, you have everything. It's up there on the bookshelf and all you have to do is put it together. It wouldn't take me very long at all. In fact, I've done it in less time than that. Okay, so just for a second, let's make a distinction between first design and first development. Content first design is when you consider the totality of the content before creating the design. And that makes sense because the result is that the design best accommodates the content. You're developing a design that is going to best accommodate the content. Content first development, on the other hand, is that you don't build any of the website well, outside of maybe a, a mock-up or two, you don't get into any development. You don't spend your valuable time doing development until the content's been received. And so the result is the same as the content first design, plus it puts the proper resource in control, whether that's the client or a third party or you. The project is less likely to stall. The development time is reduced significantly and you preserve your ROI because you're not doing work you're not getting paid for. And that's another thing that, especially you guys that are kind of new at this. Okay, I'm reading a comment from Shanta. She says, she's in it right now. A project that was supposed to take three weeks is at six months. The next contract she signs with them is going to be content first, right? <laughs> that gave me chill bumps. Thank you, Shanta. Yeah, we all have to learn lessons and, and the, the way you get better at your job is by learning these lessons. I'm trying to get people so they don't have to experience the pain, they can just go ahead and start out the right way. The reason this preserves your ROI is that you're not doing work you're not getting paid for yet, and you're waiting for payment. The other thing that I try to tell new people is you need to assign an hourly rate to your work. I'm not saying you need to advertise that to anybody. If you do value-based pricing, that is perfectly fine, but you need to know what is your worth? What are you counting your worth for on that particular project by the hour? Because any hour or portion thereof that you spend on that project that was not in your project plan and not in your estimate, you're giving that away. You're losing your ROI. Stop doing that, okay? I'm just gonna be your mama today and tell you to stop doing that. So the six steps of content collection go like this. First, you're gonna determine your initial content requirements. We'll break these all down in just a second. You're gonna craft your initial content estimate. What, estimate content? Yes, you need to estimate the content along with everything else, regardless of who's doing the job, who's doing the content part. You need to set your client expectations regarding content refine your content needs because once you get to this point there could be some activities happening that are going to change those content needs so you need to refine that before you populate your content collection mechanism and we'll talk about the different types of those then you need to manage your content collection activities it's your responsibility to manage those activities just like the client cannot hand off the website to you and then come back later and say where's my website you can't just hand off to the client and say, okay, come back on such and such a date with all the content. 
there's got to be some management going on in there in that process. Okay, we're going to break those down. Step one is determine the initial content requirements. And the best way to do that is with a visual site map. I usually do this after the pre-proposal meeting with the client before I have done the estimate. Just by having the conversation with the client in your pre-proposal meeting, you're getting ready to estimate. Usually by this time, you can figure out what the pages are. Then I usually create a visual site map. And now I clicked over there. So now I have to click over here to make sure that goes. And I break this down into regular pages, gallery pages, and product pages. Regular pages is anything that's a, a post or a page. Anything that's just a regular page with text and videos and whatever it has on it. Gallery pages obviously is galleries and that's mostly photos or videos. And then product pages. The six steps looks great. <laughs> just hoping she shows it on Wednesday. I'll be happy to, Todd. Okay, so for those of you who don't know, on Wednesday I'm going to be on Todd's office hours and we're going to be talking all about project management, mostly related to uh, copywriting, but this, this applies. If you're the copywriter on the project, it'd be helpful if you knew this stuff. <laughs> I break it down into these three categories because those are the ones that are the most different. You could break it down into even more detail, but at this point, I don't want to put a lot of work in it. I'm just working on the proposal. So I break it down into those three pages. Then the next step is to estimate the content. You might be asking the question, why are you estimating content? Well, just as I said, it is your job to manage the project. A rough order of magnitude can also be a selling tool. And it's a good basis for your entire initial project estimate. When I do this rough order of magnitude, and I have a spreadsheet I used to, that is available in the premium membership of the Academy, so you don't have to start from scratch. And I break this down even a little further into paragraphs, images, videos, products, forms, and tables. That's usually, oops, let me back up. That, those are usually the six types of content. Now, there might be other kinds of content, but for the most part, this is how it's broken down. And it's the way it is on my spreadsheet anyway. After I've done that, bring this over. In some cases, depending on which sitemap tool you use, you can actually export the CSV and then import it into a spreadsheet. And in the premium membership, in the content collection roadmap, I walk you through all the steps. I show you which tool I use and, and how that works. You don't have to use those tools. You can do this a lot more manually, but it's time consuming. So we have the page name, the page type. This time I'm breaking it down a little further. It's an information page. It's a bio page. It's something on the menu. It's frequently asked questions. It's videos. I have those pages down. Then I make a note whether there's existing content or not, because sometimes if it's another website and basically you're just moving it and maybe tweaking the content, then I call that existing content. That's going to have a bearing on your estimate. And then I make a guesstimate. Notice I put the G in front of estimate because at this point you're just guessing. Okay, so how many paragraphs are going to be on the home page? How many paragraphs do you think are going to be on the privacy policy page? How many paragraphs do you think are going to be on the contact us page? All of those paragraphs have to be written. Somebody's got to write them. I do the same with images, videos, tables, and forms. I take a guess based on how I think I'm going to design this website. You're going to validate this with the client. It's just a way of estimating what is the magnitude of this job. On the last page or worksheet of this spreadsheet I have, it adds it all up for you. For this particular example, there are 62 paragraphs, 17 images, and eight videos. In the bottom half, I estimate how much time is it going to take per paragraph? How much time is it going to take per video to shoot it and to edit it? This is however long you think it's going to take to be doing the content. 15 minutes per paragraph might be a little short if the client's doing it. Most of the time I talk the client into letting me do it or let them write it and then factor in me editing it so that it becomes right for the website. This came out to 145 man hours. The reason I do this is because once I've done this, I validate with the client. Okay, here's the pages we think we're going to have. This is before the proposal. And the other thing is we think we should only have one contact with the client before we do the proposal. Sometimes you have to ask some clarification questions in between. So that's how I couch it. I say, look, I need a little clarification on the direction you wanted to go. So if we could have one more Zoom call and let me show you some things, then I can get you a better estimate. Notice I didn't say accurate. I said better. We never say accurate estimate because there is no such thing. What is the one in the existing column? Oh, let me go back. That means they had one video already done. So that's what that means. Of the eight we need, there's one that is existing. 
let's say on the homepage, we needed four paragraphs and they were already written, there'd be a four in that column. So it's just to designate how much you already have existing. Mm -hmm. Once you've done this, once you've figured out, oh, this is one of the big points for doing the rough order magnitude is convincing your client. They do not have time to do this. If you try to tell them they don't have the skill to do it, they'll always push back. But if you show them they do not have time and they need to be focusing on their business, then you have a much better chance of convincing them to let a third party do it or let you do it. The next step is to set client expectations. You need a content management process. I believe it's in the 101 where I lay out 10 processes that are essential for good project management in your agency. One of those is content management. You have to have a process developed and written down, one that you stick to and one you explain to your clients. You also need to explain common content issues. This is the other thing. Why do we try to hide potential problems from clients? If you explain to them, these are the things we know that happen often on projects. And here's what we're going to do so that we don't have those problems on this project. That goes a long way towards establishing your authority and making you look like a professional because you are being proactive about problems you suspect are going to happen because you know everybody has this problem. If you explain that to the client, they're just going to respect you more. You need to set the expectation that they might not be the best resource for this. Now, if they've got all the time in the world, that's fine. Cause I'm going to show you how you can do this. So if there is a project stall, because they're not delivering the content, it doesn't affect your bottom line. It might affect some other things, but it doesn't affect your bottom line. You need to explain to them these client expectations. What happens if they don't deliver it on time? Nathan has, if you don't respond within X amount of time, your project goes on hold. If it's on hold for a certain amount of time, then in order to start back up, you have to pay the remainder of the budget. So there's lots of things you can put in there. You want to show them that rough order of magnitude. This is how long it's going to take you. I suspect if it's only going to take you 15 minutes to write one paragraph and they might be thinking, no, it's going to take longer than that. So then it's going to really take even longer. The other thing when you're setting client expectations, and I think I made this word up, incentivize, I don't think it's really a word, incentivize. Give your client an incentive for meeting the dates. I know it should be just enough incentive that we want to get your website done on time and within budget, but that's not how they're thinking, okay? But clients do care most about money and time. That really is what they care most about, but you have to remind them. Sometimes when I do my initial estimate, I will bump it by a few hundred dollars. That's not a pad. I bump it so I can offer them a discount if they meet their dates. It doesn't always have to be money. Sometimes people will jump through hoops to get a sports shirt with a logo on it or a ball cap or a beer or a dinner, or, you know, it could be a number of things. You have to judge that based on a client by client basis, but most of them are more interested in the bottom line. So if you can show them how this is going to save them 500 bucks, you get this done on time, it's going to save you 500 bucks. Now, the beauty part of, of bumping your estimate before you give it to them is that if they don't deliver on time, you got a little extra bonus because they didn't. That's another reason I do it that way. Step four is refining those content needs. Review that rough order magnitude with the client and assign the activities. Once you've reviewed that rough order magnitude with the client, that's when you're going to get a sense of they're insisting on doing it themselves or I'm going to do it or the third party's going to do it. But that has a bearing on your estimate. That's why you need to go ahead and assign those activities to whoever's going to be doing them at this point, because your estimate's going to be different if you're doing it, or if the client's doing it, or if a third party's doing it, or if it's a combination of you and the client or a combination of the client and the copywriter. Then you want to create your content specification. This is where you get a lot more detailed about what's going to be part of the content. We need a hero image. We need a heading for the homepage. We need a blurb for the contact us page, those sorts of things. Then you want to populate your content collection mechanism. What can you use as a content collection mechanism? Well, you can just use paper and have them fill that out manually. I have done that before with a small website with a very non-techie client. It was much easier to give them a stack of paper and had it all spelled out exactly what we needed. And they did it that way. 
They gave me a thumb drive with the images on it. How they knew how to use a thumb drive, but they didn't want to deal with having to input their stuff on the computer, I don't know. But I try to avoid that. You know, I'd rather have it online. For online, you can use products like Gather Content, Integrify, Slick Plan, Content Snare. I use Content Snare. I love it. It's a little time consuming to set up the first time, but you can save things as individual templates and reuse them over and over. In the long term, it really does make things way easier. And you can put all your instructions in there for how should a headline read, what should a hero image have, what the sizes need to be. That's the other thing Content Snare does is it can say, okay, no images above this size. If they try to upload one at the wrong format, or maybe they all have to be JPEGs. I'm just using that as an example. If they try to upload an SVG or upload a PNG, it's not going to take it. Of course, you wouldn't want to eliminate PNGs, but that was just as an example. Or you could just use a spreadsheet. You could use a Google Drive with folders. It gets a little cumbersome, in my opinion, to do it that way. But with Content Snare, if you use that, then export it to a text file, and then you import it into your website, and all is good. Okay, I'm trying to get all this in in a half hour, y'all. Oh, we're already past a half hour, but anyway, we'll keep going. If you're considering Content Snare Shanta, please use my affiliate link. I get a whole dollar and a half if you, if you use my link that's inside the course. Uh, step six, manage the content collection activities. This is the bugaboo. This is where things usually fall apart. I could say you want to break the job down for the client. Don't send it all to them for all pages all at once. When you do your project plan, you're going to want to break that down into chunks. Maybe you do it one page at a time, or you could even break it down into one section at a time. That makes it really easy for the client. You want to ensure the content's being delivered to the repository as scheduled. Content Snare does that automatically. You want to ensure that content's being delivered in the proper format. As I said, Content Snare does that automatically. You want to have regular status calls with the client or some sort of reminder exchange communication. It doesn't necessarily have to be a phone call, but you want to find out what's going on. Maybe they had a child that got sick. And in that case, you might want to make an allowance. If it's something totally reasonable as to why they haven't gotten it done, you want to be a nice person. But if it's just that, well, I hadn't gotten around to it, I hadn't gotten around to it, I hadn't gotten around to it, that's different than I had to take my child to the hospital because he broke his arm. <laughs> you know, I mean, it could be any number of things. If they need help, offer the help. But you can't offer the help if you don't know where they are in their process. And of course, you never, ever want to offer that help for free. I know people think that's an over-delivering, but you're just shooting yourself in the foot if you start doing work for your client and don't get paid for it. And then if there are signs that the dates are going to be missed, you want to invoke the change control process immediately. That change control process is a whole nother lesson for a whole nother day. And we've covered it ad nauseum in my little Can We Talk About Your WordPress Projects uh, video series, as well as throughout the academy and throughout some of the freebies I give away. It's a big deal. Now that you've got the content collection process down, what are some best practices that also help with this? Well, one is the two-step proposal process or approval process. And you don't have to do it exactly the way I do it, but the whole point is to get paid for the discovery. Restructure your payment schedule. Embrace the idea of a minimum viable website. Structure the project plan for content first and automate where possible. Now I'm going through this fairly quickly because I don't want to keep y'all real long on these lives in the group because I know you have businesses to run. You can come back and watch this video again if you can't remember any of this. Okay, this is not for everybody, all right? This is what works for me. I know it works for some of my students and it works for other people, but this might not be the way you want to do it. So the best practice number one is the two-step approval process. This means you don't put a pad in. It prevents you doing any work for zero. You get better at estimating over time and you get paid for the detailed discovery. Now, did I subscribe it? Oh, let's, that's number two. Okay, so for those of you who are new to watching my stuff, the two-step proposal process. When I give them the proposal, I give them a range estimate of price. It also has a change budget in there that is set aside just for change. But I give them a range price and tell them that phase one is the discovery. At the end of discovery, there will be a more precise estimate. 
Notice I didn't say accurate estimate, more precise estimate, because then you have figured out those things have come up that they forgot, that you forgot, good ideas that came up. You now want to incorporate into the website that would never have come up in an hour and a half pre-proposal meeting, especially with a client that might not be all that sure about what it is they want. Deep dive discovery does that. At the end of the deep dive, that's when you've got your scope of work. You're actually, it's your full website specification is done at the end of the deep dive. If the estimate, because there were changes along the way, if the second estimate comes in higher than the original range estimate, I give the client the option to cancel, but they hardly ever do because they were right there with you. When these new requirements came up, they know that that wasn't included in the original proposal, so they don't usually balk about it. But if they do, you just hand over the statement of work that you've already been paid for and you tell them to go find someone else to do it. That's all you have to do. And that way you're getting paid. You lose out on the actual building of the website, which is actually the fun part. We all know that the artistic and fun part. But nonetheless, you leave with a happy client and you're happy because you got paid. It's a win-win for everybody. Some people do a separate paid discovery, like it's a separate project. I have trouble selling that, okay? I incorporate it into the project. Up to that point, we haven't drawn a line in the sand, so we don't have to invoke the change control process because we've got this huge range of money that we're working with. As long as we don't go over the top end, then we're good. Next is to restructure your payment schedule. I know some people have this much at the beginning, then 30 days later, it's this much, 60 days later, it's this much, or however they structure it out by time. But I do it by phase. Upon acceptance of the proposal, I get a deposit that covers all of that discovery phase. Upon the acceptance of the statement of work, I get a percentage of whatever's left. And usually I get 50% of whatever's left. Then we wait for the client to provide the content. Once they provide the content, we do deployment and testing. At the completion of testing, I get 50% of whatever's left in the budget. At the completion of training, I get all the rest of the funds due. Now, training comes before the site goes live. So we get the money before we turn the site to live. Biggest lesson you can ever learn. Do not give a client a live website until you have all the money doesn't make sense. And Michael is asking a question. I know you are not a fan of padding the estimate, but I'm curious about your feelings about padding by enough so that you can look like a hero when they ask you for that one small item. Good idea or bad idea? After looking like a hero, then I tell them I can do this, but this is the only time it can happen. From here on, it's a change order. I don't know. I think maybe, Michael, you just got to do that on a client by client basis. You have a way of talking that I think your clients would adhere to that the next time. I do the change control process from the very beginning. It doesn't matter how small the change is. I'm going to estimate the, the impact to the schedule. I'm going to estimate the impact to the cost. Sometimes it's a, a change to the schedule that doesn't affect cost or vice versa but usually it affects both. I just feel it's a good idea to get the client in the habit of that right away. Also, when you're estimating that and you have a few more questions for the client, it, it gets revealed what started out as one little small thing was not really that small all to begin with. For example, and this would be further along, pad it and offer a discount if they're done in a timely manner. Yeah, well, I don't call that a pad. A pad is usually when you're padding for things you don't know about yet. And I say, you need to plan for things you don't know about yet and work it into the whole process, which is why I do the two-step proposal process. That was um, Melanie that said, pat it and offer a discount if they've done it in a timely manner. Yeah, that's just how I feel about it. But you know what? I put these things out here because they're IT principles that have worked for years and years and years in corporate. The man that taught this to me was able to change his business so much he grew to be like a global consulting firm by um, employing these principles. I was going to use the example, um, this will be further along, but to your client, changing that shade of blue on every single button across the entire website might to them seem like a small change, but that's probably going to be pretty time consuming for you depending on how big the website is. Embrace the minimum viable website. What is a minimum viable website? When I suspect the client might be overestimating their ability to provide the website content, but they want to get launched really fast. 
And I will suggest we start with the stuff you already have or the stuff you can get together quickly. We'll go ahead and launch the website and add this other functionality or these other pages later. That way it becomes two separate projects with two separate contracts. You might have a master services agreement like Nathan teaches that covers your processes and things that don't change from project to project, but it would definitely be two different scopes of work. One for the minimum viable website and the other for the adding on. The minimum viable website, I stole that from the entrepreneur community where they launch a minimum viable product so customers can look at it, see what they like, and they can judge how to better develop the product later on. That's the whole concept. You want to restructure your project plan for content first. Well, I have five phases, four of them after the project is accepted. Yours might be different, but this is how I manage the content. So during phase zero, because it's not really a project yet, proposal creation, that's when we estimate the needed content. Big step people leave out. Phase one is project definition. This is that deep dive where we're going to come up with our statement of work, which is the website specification. At this point, you're going to identify who's going to do it and when, then you're going to estimate again. Design and preparation is during this phase. Now what you're doing while the client might be off collecting and gathering content is preparing the staging environment. You might be working up a couple of mock-ups but you're not doing any development that's time consuming at all. So you, you have very few hours in this phase. <laughs> then we move to development and testing and then deployment and training. Okay. Best practice number five is to automate where possible. Here are some examples of where you can automate. I do my visual sitemap in slick plan because it has that feature where you can export it to a CSV and I can import it into my ROM spreadsheet very fast. Content snare and WP feedback. The reason I don't recommend WP feedback for content is because you need to keep the content activities outside the website. If you try to combine design and content, the client is never going to pay attention to content. They're only going to pay attention to the design. They're going to get distracted. They're going to say, why doesn't this button work? Or why doesn't that button work? Or I don't like that color. You want them to focus on, oh, we don't care about any of that. Just get us this content. Then we'll do the design and you can look at it. You've already agreed to a design during the deep dive. You've already got that approved, but for them to actually see it, you want to wait and do that after you've got the content and after you've got the content in there. It'll save you a huge amount of time. Okay, so let's recap. Six steps of content collection. Determine the initial content requirements. Craft the initial content estimate. Set client expectations regarding content. Refine the content needs. And I forgot to mention, refine the content needs. I use wireframes to do this. So when I said don't do any development, I do this in Elementor. So I am technically designing the website, but I'm only designing the layout and I'm using all black and white images because what you're doing is just defining the spots where the content needs to go. And then uh, the, the client may say, oh, well, I think that's gonna actually be about six paragraphs, not four paragraphs. Well, now you need a bigger space on the page for the content or they might decide they need more pages. So I forgot to mention that early on, that that's where the wireframes come in, is refining those content needs. Populate your content collection mechanism and manage the content collection activities. Implementing content first, these are your best practices. Use a two-step proposal process or approval process or some way that you're getting paid for the discovery and that you're not giving the client a final estimate until that discovery is done. That is shooting yourself in the foot because there's always going to be things that come up when you start diving a little deeper into what needs to be on these bio pages. Maybe you thought it was going to be a photograph of each of the senior executives and they say, oh no, each of those senior executives is going to have a video. So, you know, boom, big change there, especially if you're going to be responsible for arranging someone to shoot that video or edit that video and or restructure your payment schedule. Embrace the idea of the minimum viable website, structure the project plan for content first, and automate where possible. For those of you who are watching this, who are not in my group and don't know about this, the way to learn more and how to do these, and I give some done for you processes and tell you exactly what needs to be in there, as well as some scripts for what to say to clients, you can find out more about that in the WP Project Managers Academy, which you can find at wpredmaps.com forward slash join us.
The basic membership is free. You get access to WordPress Project Management 101, the roadmap there, and that's more of a DIY. I do give you some done for you processes, but if you want all of those that are done for you and to get going a lot more faster, then we have a premium membership, which also includes the Project Management 101 roadmap because that's what everybody needs to know. It's the basics of project management, the basics of scope creep control, and the basics of client management. But you also get access to the new complete project management roadmap for WordPress, where we've got it broken down. Oops, <clears throat> back up. Where we've got it broken down into 11 different roadmaps, smaller roadmaps that are focused on the life cycle of the project, as well as the problem solving roadmaps like scope creep and client management and that sort of thing. We also just added certification to the free program. For those of you who are wondering why I'm doing it this way when I'm inside the group right now, it's because I plan to repurpose this on YouTube. There'll be people watching this that are outside our group later. I decided it was better to start doing these Can We Talk About Your WordPress projects inside our group so you guys don't miss anything. You can get certified. When you do it in the free program, you'll be certified as a WP Project Manager Level 1. In the premium program, the level two certification will be coming very soon. Right now, if you enroll in the free program and you get through all the training, we have two now that have gotten certified as level one project managers. The course itself is free, but later on there'll be a small charge for that. And if you're not in the Facebook group, you can join our Facebook group. If you just search on WordPress PM, you'll find us. There are three entry questions you have to answer to get in the group. I don't judge you. We don't retain that information. That is just to kind of keep the riffraff out. So that's the end of today's episode. Lord have mercy. I went on almost an hour, but this is a topic that is so important and such a big problem in our industry, not just with WordPress, but any web development project has this problem with getting content from the client. So you can always email me if you have any questions or anything at beth at wproadmaps.com. You can hit me up in the Facebook group, send me a message on Facebook, also Twitter at wproadmaps. You can get me a lot of different ways if you have questions or you want to find out more about the program or what we're doing. Okay, that's all for today's episode of Can We Talk About Your WordPress Projects. Um, until I see you next time, remember, stay productive, stay strong, and never stop learning. I'll see you guys next time. Bye, guys.